So what if you have strings? So every string value has a Unicode numeric value and you can get the numeric value by using a special Python function called ORD, O-R-D. And uh, any language you use will usually have a way of converting your characters to actual the number value. So for example, ORD of C is a 99, ORD of A is 87, and so on. So let's look at some code to take a string and create a number. So we're going to take the ORD of a bunch of uh, individual characters and create one number. And we can do that by just summing up the ORDs. So here's the code. So I wrote a, a function called string to num. It has a sum set to zero. It loops through all the characters of the string passed. It converts the character to an ORD and adds it to the sum and returns it. And then I defined a new hash function that takes that number and modulos 11, the size of our table. And I wrote a little code to run this. Let me show you that. So that's in this uh, hash for strings. So this is the first function, and you'll see it gets the the uh, it converts my name to a number. So we're going to see my name printed out as a number. So it says uh, the first one says my name is five twenty one. That's if you add up all the characters. Now there's a problem with this. Uh, is if I uh, you, if, if there are two strings with the same exact letters, in other words an anagram, they will always add up to the same total number. So anagrams will always conflict and pick the same slot. So if we want to avoid that, uh, we can apply a separate weight to each character. And so we rewrote the, uh, the string to number this. We added the word weight to the name of the function. And we do a sum. But here, we don't just sum the ordinal of the character. See, we're pulling out the character here. We take, uh, we have a i, which is going to go from 0 to the length minus 1. So we add 1 to i. So as we go through the loop, this will be 1 times the ordinal, 2 times the ordinal. So this i plus 1 is a weight that will multiply the ordinal so that uh, the weight at the beginning of the string will have a different weight at the ending. So now, if we have the same letters rearranged, we would actually get a different number. And so this is a little trick to solve that. So I, I put this in this code as well. And the second time, the second code's down here, and it calls it here to weight it. And you'll see that when I do the weighted string, I get this number. I get a completely different number. Both of these numbers, to use them for the hash, we would just do modulo the size of our table, which is 11. And so that's how you would use strings. So now you're still going to have a few collisions, even if you do all these methods, unless you have a perfect hash function, uh, which is a very special case, because usually you don't know what data you're going to put in. Uh, Google certainly doesn't know what website someone's going to write, so they can't make a perfect uh, hash for all websites. Uh, if they were just going to hash uh, like just the first one million websites, they could design a perfect hash, as long as no, nobody changed those 1,000 websites or 100 websites. Um, so we're going to look at uh, how to put uh, two items in the same slot. We need to have a systematic method uh, to add the item to the hash table. And this is called collision resolution. So here's the techniques we're going to cover. Uh, three of the techniques co come under one category. It's called open addressing. And the thing about open addressing is a uh, keep the data in the table. So I'll put a little note there. So when you do open addressing, the data is kept directly in the table. So, and there are three versions of that. There's linear probing, rehashing, and quadratic probing. So we're going to cover all three of those. And then there's another technique where if it if you have a collision in the table, you don't actually store it in the table. You then store it somewhere else. So you can you can. Uh, solve this problem of collisions by storing your data somewhere else. And this is called chaining, the one we're going to look at there. So first, what is linear probing? So, uh, now I, I don't know if we showed you, we showed you the collision that happens where the 22 and the 77 try to pick the same slot. So, uh, what we're going to do is when you insert an item in the hash, first you have to detect that there's already something in the slot. So we have to add a little test that before we put something in the slot, we check if it's there. 
If it is, in linear probing, you just add one to your slot number and go to the slot to the right and see, is that empty? And if it is, you use it. If it's not, you keep looking to the right. And eventually you will, either two things will happen. Uh, you don't find any empty slots. That means the table's full. And though you, you have to fail in some way. Uh, or you find an empty slot and then you stick it in there. So that's how uh, you do it. Now when you look things up, you have to do the same process. So when you want to look up an item, you have to get its hash value. You look in that slot. If the item's not in that slot, you have to look for it in the next slot. And if it's not in that slot, you have to look for it in the next slot. Now you may run into an empty slot, and if you do, you know that that item was never inserted. And so you can return false when you're checking if an item is already on the table. Uh, the other th way you would return false, if, if the table's full, and you wrap around back to where the slot you started, uh, you would know that um, you also, uh, it's not in the table. So here's a little picture of how linear probing works. So this is the table after we've added the six values. And we're about to add 44, which has the same uh, hash value as 77. So what happens is we try to insert uh, into 77, we see that that's full, so we go to the next slot, and it's empty, so we put 44 in there. So that's it. Now we're going to we're going to insert uh, 55. So when we try to insert 55, it also has a index of zero for the hash, so that's full. It tries the next one, that one's full. So finally, it finds an empty one in slot two and puts it there. Now we're going to insert a uh, Oh, let me just point out, we're, this is forming a cluster now. So what we have is we have three slots taken up. So if we try to insert something in any of these three hash spots, it's going to fill to the right. And this tends, a cluster tends to uh, affect things because it makes the cluster grow bigger. And it, the probability of it get growing bigger gets more. So it, it tends to be almost like an infection. So now we're going to insert 20. So what when we do 20, it should go in slot 9, which is over here. Now the way the linear function works is if, if you're inserting and you don't find anything, you wrap around. So we try to put it in 9, it's already used. We go to 10, it's already used. So you wrap around to the beginning of the table. And you do this by, uh, when you add 1, you also take the modulus by the size of the table, and that will automatically wrap you around. And it shows you that here. Since you add, uh, you're at 10, and you add one more, and you take modulus 11, you're going to get modulus 11, 11, which is a remainder of zero. So that automatically wraps you around to here. So now this is full, so we keep searching. This is full, we keep searching. This is full, and finally you put it in 20. So you can see because of this cluster here, we had to skip a lot of slots to find a place for 20. So that's basically the problem is clustering. Uh, when you have clustering, the cluster tends to propagate. As you have more slots that are adjacent, you get even more. So this will cause problems in uh, how well your, your hash table works. So one way to fix this is a technique called rehashing. So instead of using the original slot, you pick another slot. Uh, and in rehashing, you actually have a, a new function called the rehash function. So you take the position that you last tried, and you have a skip value that's a constant. And the first one we're going to try is just adding 2. So instead of picking the next slot, every time you're going to go 2 to the right, you're going to skip over one and try the next slot and see if it's empty. And so this will tend to avoid clustering. Uh, so you basically take the position plus skip, and then you modulus the table so it wraps around. Now it's important when you do this uh, that you have a table that has an odd length, not odd, but prime number length. And that's because if you start adding uh, to this like that, if it's not a prime number, it won't hit every slot as it tries to look for a slot in the table unless it's a prime number. And that's why we chose our table in the book to be size 11. Uh, so this another technique is called quadratic probing. Um, 
So in quadratic probing, instead of being a constant skip every time, you add a value to the skip every time you use it. So you, ha you skip a little more each time you go to the right by a constant amount. It turns out if you work out the math, you get a formula like this. You get the original hash, and then the, if that fails, you go to the original hash plus 1, which is 1 squared. And if that fails, you go to the original hash plus 2 squared. Then you go to the original hash plus 3 squared, and so on. So you actually end up slots that look like this, where these are all perfect squares of the, of the integers. So that's called quadratic probing. Uh, so those, are, those were all the open addressing techniques. So now we're going to talk about chaining. And you're going to implement chaining as an exercise. Uh, and you can do it either as a linked list or as, as uh, using a list. So what chaining is, is you don't store the actual hash values in the hash table anymore. The hash table starts out the same. It's all a value of none. Uh, but when you go to insert a new item, uh, if, there's, if there's nothing in the uh, slot yet, you create a list and you point to that list and you add the hash value into that list. Then in the future, if you have a conflict uh, in the same slot, you just add the new item to the end of that list and that's called the chain. You can also use it uh, the single link nodes that we introduced uh, in the previous chapter. So you can also, instead of adding a list, when you first start out and you first find a slot that's empty and you're going to add an item, you create a single link node with that as data and you link it from the, from the table and point to that node. And then if you add something else that has a conflict, it already has a link in that node, you follow the links to the end of the list and you add it to the end of the list. So each, each uh, point in the table, so we, let me get a picture of the original table, each point in the table, instead of a number, would have a, it would point to a linked list. This would be the head of a linked list. So that's how you would use it for linked using a linked list. Uh, but you can also use a regular list instead of a linked list. So this shows you a picture of using a linked list. And if you're using a list, you would just take out these arrows. You just have a list here that you start building. So you replace none with a pointer to this. Uh, as soon as you can. So this is what this is from the book. This is after these numbers been, we've been working with were all inserted. You'd see it looks like this.